the amount of brutality on this trail is unreal. Part two, miles 56 to 134. Walking on a road out of Pole Bridge. We're at a really great stay. I'm on this first stretch of road where I can see a long ways down. Makes a nice echoing sound. From Pole Bridge, there was about 10 miles of road walking west along Hay Creek before the PNT became a trail again and started cutting northwest. The second leg of the primary route of the Pacific Northwest Trail in 2022 was bounded by the North Fork Flathead River to the east and the Kootenai River to the west. From the small hamlet of Pole Bridge, you head west over the Whitefish Mountain Range, first through the Flathead National Forest, and then the Kootenai National Forest, meandering north to Canada before road walking south to the town of Eureka, Montana, in a large open valley. This section was 78 miles long and took me from mile 56 to mile 134 of my 1250 mile journey along the Pacific Northwest Trail. The PNT is the newest National Scenic Trail, having been designated only in 2009. It's a monumental task to make a trail that goes across multiple state lines, all while somehow remaining on beautiful hiking trails. Someday, hopefully the PNT will be something like that. But until then, it occasionally departs trails and uses dirt roads and even paved roads to make its way west. And sometimes the trails it uses are places people hardly ever go. Right, as my road walk is finally sort of coming to an end. I mean, it's still a road, but no vehicles are allowed on it, so that's something. The trail uh, gets pretty overgrown here, so I'm gonna batten down the hatches, put on my rain gear, which will also protect me from the mosquitoes, and that way I can go through the wet brush and not get soaked before bedtime. It's a bit intimidating to be uh, walking down a little brushy corridor where you can't see very far, and every 15 feet there's bear scat. <laughs> Hey yo! Hey yo! Now it's uh, hailing. The snow made its debut as I headed towards my planned campsite, Red Meadow Lake. 2022 was a heavy snow year because intense spring storms in the Pacific Northwest refreshed the snowpack just before the hiking season. I knew there would be snow, but I didn't quite expect the reality. This four-day section would be some of the most demanding backpacking I had ever done. Here's the tracks of the three guys I met in town. Salty, shaggy, and goofy. And uh, here's some fresher tracks over here. Made by a heavy individual. I'm uh, glad I've been shouting hey bear. Hey yo! Hey yo! At this early stage in the Pacific Northwest Trail's lifetime, hikers do have the chance to experience a long distance trail with a far greater deal of solitude. This is actually part of what appealed to me about the Pacific Northwest Trail. You know, I've never spent much time in Montana and it feels a lot like where I grew up, but just a bit more wild, a bit more remote. So it's interesting to see that sort of ecology and landscape, how it transitions into something slightly different like this. I typically most enjoy hiking alone, but when it comes to setting up camp, it can be wonderful to have company, especially when the conditions have been harsh. Red Meadow is only three-fourths of a mile off the trail, but since it was all on rutted snow, I started to question if it was worth the extra effort as I headed up. Thankfully, and amazingly, there was one other party at the lake that night. Oh man, I see people over there with a fire. <laughs>
pretty cold night here at Red Meadow, but when I got here, I ran into Nathan and Stacy, and they shared their fire with me, and uh, I was able to cook dinner there and warm up by the fire and talk with them, so that was just the perfect little nice thing I was hoping for to find up here after a uh, somewhat rough first day out from Paul Bridge. All right, well, thankfully, last night I slept pretty well. Got through it. <laughs> Nathan and Stacy were up at Red Meadow Lake on a uh, mission to catch some Alaska silverlings. There are these cute little fish. He caught one and showed it to me and, uh, you know, threw it back and it had this really interesting fin. There's supposed to be all sorts of colors in. And thanks again, Stacy and Nathan, for your campfire hospitality. Super appreciated. <laughs> The second day from Pull Bridge to Eureka would be the first of two extremely taxing days through the lingering Montana snowpack. The PNT heads northwest from Red Meadow Lake along the Whitefish Divide Trail and tries to stick to the ridges, but there are plenty of gaps or low saddles where you must go down before you can go back up. The actual trail underneath the snow is a small track that often zigzags along very steep grades, which means when it's covered in snow, it's harder to follow than your average trail. These poles are useless. Time to switch to my ice axe. It's been just a ton of uh, going around in the snow. I looked at the elevation for the rest of this section. And I think there's gonna be a lot of this. Woke up nice and late. Uh, let myself, you know, wait for the sun a little bit. And since I knew I was gonna get to a ridge, where I could call Justine, I figured she wouldn't appreciate it if I called her at six or seven in the morning <laughs> on a work day. So yeah, this should time nicely now where hopefully she'll maybe even be on her lunch break or something. Hello! <laughs> Not in, I'm not in Eureka, that's for sure. This section is uh, turning out to be quite difficult. <laughs> well, it's been nice following Shaggy Salty and Goofy's tracks. It's helped out a lot. Haven't been just blindly doing it. I caught a couple of turns before they did, one or two. Of course, the trail has to stick to the north side. Snow just makes your work a lot harder. If you're wondering how it's possible to feel confident following such a small trail through such large areas covered in snow with very few long sight lines, the main answer is GPS. This section, like several others on the PNT, has you checking your phone every 10, 15, or 20 minutes to be sure you are still on trail or to determine how to get back to the trail. Of course, hikers should always carry backup physical maps and a compass in case they drop their phone in a stream. And thankfully, the Pacific Northwest Trail Association releases updated maps for free every year, which hikers can print or buy on weatherproof paper. I had some of these paper maps and a tiny compass with me in case worse came to worst. Man, I am exhausted. I think it's like 6 p.m. and I still have like four miles to go in order to have gone 15 today. Holy crap, dude. After many ups and downs in the snow, I reached a second easier challenge of the day, the first burn on the PNT. This burn on the lead up to Mount Locke was thankfully not too thick with blowdowns, though there were some, of course. The trail itself was more of a tripping hazard, having been extremely steep in sections before the burn and eroded in places after it. Sometimes the snow was actually a relief. 
I just climbed up that super steep ridge in the burn. I get to the top to my summit for the day. Mount lock, I believe. Look over the other side. What is this? A sheer cliff? <laughs> oh. I'm gonna have to go down one of these ways. Cannot believe how few miles I've done for the time of day and how tired I am. It means that tomorrow I'm gonna be waking up at like four probably. Fucking booking it. From the summit of Mount Locke, I made my way down the snowy northern slopes of the burn to Blue Sky Creek. I had only gone around 16 miles and it was getting dark, but thankfully there was at last a chance to make some quick miles. We got to the 15 mile point. It had a stream I had to cross. <laughs> Pretty cold, but I stopped at that campsite, made myself a big old bowl of mac and cheese with red pepper flakes. Oh, it was so good going fast to get warm again. I think this day, despite starting so late, can even be salvaged. It's not good to hike after dark in grizzly territory, but I'm only gonna be doing it for a little bit. Still got a few more miles to go. It's so nice to be back on a trail you can actually make quick progress on. Whew, I'm all warmed up. hey -o. hey -o. Hey, Bear. I camped that night where the PN team at Grave Creek and Forest Road 114, just before the light was totally gone. I had barely made my goal of hiking over 20 miles. Okay, starting off the next day here in Montana. It's funny, the trail goes very uh, far north. It basically goes to touch the border with Canada. The PNT used to head west on Forest Road 114, but a fire closure means the main route now heads north to Foundation Camp Creek Trail. The easy walking on snow-free roads belied what was ahead, and I even thought perhaps I was through the worst of the snow. Alas, that was not to be. Salty, shaggy, and goofy that day, after having followed their footprints through the snow, and we chatted a bit before they moved on. They're a very quick group, and I like to stop and start a lot for video, so I knew it wouldn't make too much sense to try to hike with them, but it was really nice to have some other people in this section to leapfrog with, since there were so many challenges in the snow. The reroute does have one particular benefit. It takes you past Mount Wham which for a short detour offers great views of the Whitefish Mountains and the Ten Lake scenic area which the PNT heads through next. Mount Wham, you cut back southwest on the Highline Trail, back to where the PNT originally routed, a ridgeline just south of Big and Little Therio Lakes. Yesterday we had bear prints, and today we have mountain lion. <laughs> today is going much, much smoother. Day three out of Pole Bridge is like. Uh, Smooth ridge walking for once, which is pretty awesome. 
pretty happy about that. Day three, much better than day two so far. I've just been thinking of Justine's music and singing a little bit of Trickster Mistakes. <laughs> To the day. I had uh, already planned out a little power snack of the rest of my Fritos in a Milky Way bar. This cliff is really cool. I think it might still be the Belt Supergroup that I was seeing in Glacier. Oh. Now I get up close and personal with the rock. Glacially carved headwalls near alpine lakes and scattered stands of larches are some of the memorable characteristics of the Ten Lakes scenic area. And there is one primo PNT campsite in this area, Bluebird Lake. Unfortunately, this was not an option for me on July 6th, 2022. what I'm uh, going up here. Certainly glad I have my ice axe. This is the actual path here. I went up there and had to slide my way down that cliff. Please let it be easier from here. This is truly something. Oh boy. Bluebird Lake is all snowed in. This is the campground right here. Oh my god. And the very final climb of the section basically is coming up. So if I can just get that done, I'll eat my burrito for dinner rather than cook, and then get to the next water source and camp. I should be okay. Just got up with Shaggy and Salty and uh, Goofy. Hmm. I near the very high point. Going up and some my dinner burrito. Anyways, just need to chill. We feel for the final thing, just like I did last night. 8.26 p.m. Fuck, man. Hmm. There's all these larches up here. They're really cool. Too bad I'm not in a spot where I can appreciate this a bit more. Oh. I'm serious fucking business, man. Time to fucking finish this day. After Bluebird Lake slash Snowfield, the PNT gained a ridge and skirted Green Mountain before finally heading down from the snow-laden high altitudes of the section. The day, which was beginning to feel desperate as I post holed along a snowy ridge line while the light failed, suddenly warped into a larger, friendlier shape when I crested the last saddle and realized I had made it to the western edge of the mountain range. Oh. 
Oh man, on this side of the mountain, the sun's still up in the sky a bit. Oh. This yellow golden light as you see over the ridge and suddenly the light is extended by a couple of hours. I feel warm again. Skating down the snow. This was one of those unforgettable moments that can only come unexpectedly after a long day of hard work, where suddenly everything that seemed hostile moments before is transformed into joy. It's the feeling of pushing all the way through difficulty. I plunged into the forest, flooded with snowmelt, following the fiery sun as it flickered through the branches and soaked into subalpine fir, Engelman spruce, lodgepole pine, Douglas fir, and whitebark pines. Definitely crossed mile 100 without even realizing it today. It's definitely a milestone considering how hard it's been. Oh, these past two days. Uh. I cut up that evening with Salty, Shaggy, and Goofy, and we camped in a small clearing along the Blacktail Trail a few miles past a creek. We actually head huddled, and Salty said something like, That was a good day. All right, are you ready for town? <laughs> ready to walk to town? No. Oh, fuck, yeah. <laughs> I guess we still gotta walk there. The fourth and final day of the section from Pole Bridge to Eureka in Montana, we just had about 16 or 17 miles contouring a ridge north to the border with Canada and then zigzagging downhill and cutting straight south on roads to Eureka. After the past three days, we were all pretty excited to get to town. And here we are at the border with Canada. Pretty funny how they clear cut the mark like this. The border between America and Canada is a uh, interesting place with regards to tribal nations because of course it split so many of them up. You know, the Blackfeet have many bands in Canada more than in the United States. So it split them. The, uh, Kootenays, Kutunaha, they have many bands in Canada. The historic territory of the Kutunaha covered approximately 27,000 square miles and included swaths of Alberta, Montana, Washington, and Idaho. The Rocky Mountains were a natural eastern border, but annual movements of bands shifted over time based on relationships with other native peoples. Kootenay, Canadian, and Kootenay, American, are anglicized gloss of Kutunaha, and our names both the modern groups are called by in the U.S., such as the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes and the Kootenai Tribe of Idaho. Yeah, in Canada they uh, transformed one of their residential schools in a place like boarding schools in the U.S., a place of genocide and cultural loss, into a uh, cultural center for youth to teach their language. Kootenai language is uh, unique among all the other languages in the area. Throughout this trip, I've already crossed through many other boundaries. There's a lot of shared borderlands between Salishan people, the Kalispe, or Kalispel as it's anglicized. It has a really cool cultural committee. It's put out lots of materials. If you're headed through their areas on the trails, it's a good introduction to the people who lived here for countless generations. It's easy to forget about it. You're just walking around in the woods but these woods are the way they are because of the cultures that live in and around them. Uh, this road walk into Eureka is gonna be a lot longer than the one into Pole Bridge. devoured endless amounts of pizza. Now I've got my coffee. I've left my shoes drying outside. 
through. Montana Huckleberry Burger. That's ice cream underneath that bacon right there. America. Getting to Eureka marked the start of a pattern for me on the PNT. I would hike relatively fast, but every time I got to a trail town, I would take a full day of rest. The PNT is just a little bit tougher than most other long distance trails. Though it's half the length of the Pacific Crest Trail, it has about the same amount of elevation gain. And as I went, I encountered just enough unexpected difficulties in nearly every section to make the prospect of a full rest day and sleeping in a bed seem pretty irresistible. The hikers descend on their natural feeding habitat. Stein's Grocery Market, ready to resupply for the next section from Eureka to Yak, or more likely, Bonner's Ferry. I'll be getting my resupply here too. So Shaggy, Salty, and Goofy, and then Jennifer and Skylar, don't have trail names yet, who uh, also are here and spending the day in Eureka as well, like I am, for a full zero to get a nice rest. I've been hanging out with Shaggy and Salty and Goofy, and they headed out today after breakfast. But yeah, I've got all my gear repacked. I sent home some heavy stuff. We'll see how it goes. I'm pretty excited. Time to uh, go catch up with Jennifer and Skylar again and finish off some, some town treats, such as this pecan sticky bun I got from the bakery. Oh yeah. Hmm. All right, well, I just met Carlos as he was uh, coming out of the Silverado where he is also staying. Now I'm uh, on my way to the Dewey Front Porch Brewery to pick up my hat that I left there on the first night in town. So I got my maps for the next section, which is good. Very, very refreshed now. All right, well, I wasn't planning on it, but this is the Huckleberry Burger with ice cream and jalapenos in Eureka at the Dewey Front Porch Brewery. Burger Company. Yes, surprisingly, that burger is actually delicious. With a full belly and buzzed on coffee, as I always like to be coming out of trail towns, I was ready to head out along the Tobacco River. Leaving Eureka, the Pacific Northwest Trail takes you through some extremely remote parts of the country, in the Yak Valley. I was excited to head out to these places which aren't visited too often, and also pretty excited to have gotten through what should be the worst of the snow on my trip. <laughs> 